Hi everybody, welcome back to Statistical Methods. This is week four, lecture one, where I will begin to talk about hypothesis testing. Now, just some announcements before we get started. Homework two is due Monday, September 21st. Um, this will be posted to my stat lab. And this homework covers z-scores and the standard normal distribution, which we talked about last week. And also keep in mind that this Friday, September 18th, your first quiz is due. And this will be on the course page. Now last week we, just, uh, we covered z-scores. Um, so this is again the number of standard deviations from the sample mean a particular score is. Um, so a z-score quantifies the extremity of a particular score by putting it in terms of standard deviation. We also talked about probability distributions, um, which are distributions of statistics um, with known properties that allow us to answer questions like, what is the, part, uh, the probability of getting a z-score that is higher than z equals blank? Now, an example of this is the standard normal distribution, which is made up of z-scores. And we also talked a bit about sampling. So the qualities of a sample whether they be large, um, small, or randomly selected or representative that allow us to generalize to broader populations. Yeah, so these three qualities here are characteristic of samples that allow us to generalize beyond our particular sample in order to make inferences about larger populations of interest. But how do all of these ideas connect in a way that allows us to test social science hypotheses? Well, that's what we'll learn this week and next week. Um, but to start out, what is a, hypo uh, a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a prediction um, to be tested in a study. It's usually derived from past observations, or in other words, data, and or theory, um, which is an explanation of some aspect of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experiment. So some examples of hypotheses. Playing violent video games makes children more aggressive. Using social media makes people more politically polarized. Meditation increases well-being and life satisfaction. Now, how do we answer these types of questions? Well, rather than relying on mere intuition and arguing about what we believe to be the case, we're better off directly testing these hypotheses and experiments to try to get to the truth of the matter. And the goal of this section of the course is to understand how hypotheses are tested within, within the predominant statistical framework used by social scientists. So in other words, what objective criteria are used to go to and from uh, data uh, to the conclusions about these data. And to also understand how we use information collected from a sample to be able to say something about the broader populations of interest. Now here's the general logic of hypothesis testing. In most cases, researchers want to test a hypothesis about the existence of an effect of some kind. Now, when I say effect, I mean a general term referring to a relationship between variables of interest. Now, this relationship can be causal, implying cause and effect. So for example, eating fewer calories causes weight loss. But this relationship could also refer to a correlation. So where variables are related, in the sense that you can predict one from knowing the other, but the relationship is not necessarily one of cause and effect. For example, people with higher salaries tend to have fewer children. Now when testing a hypothesis, researchers recruit a sample of participants, then they manipulate and or measure the same, uh, rather variables of interest. And from the data they collect, they calculate inferential statistics that communicate the following information. So 
So here's the type of information we get from inferential statistics. Assuming there is actually no effect, or in other words, no relationship between the variables of interest in the overall population, how probable would it be to observe the result that we did or the data that we collected? So if it would be highly improbable to obtain the data that we did under the circumstances that there actually is no effect, the research hypothesis that there is some effect is supported. But if it would be probable to obtain the data that we collected when there is no effect in the population, then the null hypothesis or the hypothesis that there is no effect can't really be ruled out. So this is the core logic behind what is known as null hypothesis significance testing or NHST. So NHST relies on this counterintuitive double negative of sorts. If my result would be unlikely, if the opposite of my hypothesis were true, I count it as support for my research hypothesis that there is some kind of relationship between these variables of interest. So now, given this information, it should be clearer why we care so much about gauging the extremity or the improbability of statistics with probability distributions. Because these tools allow us to state how probable it would be to get a statistic like ours from a probability distribution based on this null hypothesis or the hypothesis that there really is no effect or relationship between variables. So there's an example in the textbook, um, the vitamin example, and we're gonna use this to lay some foundation and put these concepts into practice. It will be much easier to see how this works in practice than it is um, from a conceptual standpoint. So here's the example. A research team has developed a new vitamin that they claim speeds up the development of babies. And it allows them to walk at an earlier age than most babies. Thus, we have our hypothesis. The vitamin will make babies walk at an earlier age than babies in the general population who have not received this vitamin. So that's our research hypothesis. And here we're gonna rely on an artificial sample using z-scores with a sample of n equals one. So that means just one baby in the experiment. And this will help us get a uh, general sense of these principles. And then later on, we'll extend this logic to larger samples. So imagine that we know for the general population of non-vitamin babies, the mean age when babies start to walk is 14 months with a standard deviation of three months. So we know that mu or the mean at the population level is 14 months. And the standard deviation sigma is three months. And note that we're using Greek letters here because we're talking about populations rather than samples. So let's imagine that this distribution of walking ages follows a normal distribution and looks like this. So again, on your X axis here, we have walking ages and we have the density of babies that start to walk at this level on the Y axis. And we see that this normally distributed distribution has a mean of 14 and a standard deviation of three. So this is the population of babies who don't receive this vitamin. They start walking at an average of 14 months with a standard deviation of three months. Now to test our hypothesis that this vitamin will cause babies to walk earlier, we're gonna to need to think about what the null distribution would look like in this case. In other words, what would a hypothetical vitamin baby distribution look like if the vitamin had zero effect on walking age? And the answer to this would be exactly like the general population of babies who have not received the vitamin if the vitamin had no effect. So under the null hypothesis, this is what that distribution would look like. 
it would be the same normally distributed distribution with a mean of 14 months and a standard deviation of three months. Because again, this is the distribution under the null hypothesis, which states that the vitamin is going to have no effect on walking age. So it would look like the general population. So with this null distribution in mind, we conduct our experiment using one baby. Now this baby receives the experimental vitamin and begins walking at the age of 18 months. And clearly this is quite a bit earlier than most babies, but is it different, different enough to say that the vitamin actually worked? And this is where we're gonna to start to use inferential statistics and deal with probability. So the process will be very similar to what you guys did last class. We're gonna convert the vitamin baby's walking age, X, into a Z-score to see how extreme it is within the reference to the overall non-vitamin distribution. So again, to do this, we subtract um, the mean from the baby's score and divide it by the standard deviation. So the score is eight minus the mean of 14 divided by three. That should get you negative two. So that is our z-score, negative two. Now we can use the standard normal distribution to ask how improbable would it be to see a baby walk this early if it came from the null distribution, so the distribution in which the vitamin uh, had no effect. So we could use this shiny app to use our standard normal distribution. And we want to see how improbable this z-score is against the standard normal distribution. So we enter our z-score of negative two, and it returns a probability of 0 0.02. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the probability of finding a result as extreme as we did, assuming that the vitamin doesn't work, would be p equals 0 0.02 or in other words, a 2% probability. So there's a 2% chance that we would find a result that looks like this if the vitamin really had no effect or if the null hypothesis were true. So is this improbable or extreme enough to reject the null hypothesis, to reject that hypothesis that the vitamin doesn't work? Now the standard convention used in most social sciences is P equals less than 0.05. That is, if there is a lower than 5% chance of finding a result as extreme as yours, if that null hypothesis is true, we take this as evidence in favor of the research hypothesis. In this case, that the vitamin worked. Now we'll spend much of our time this semester learning about how this hypothesis testing procedure works in various research uh, contexts. So, for example, in studies with different numbers of conditions, with different types of variables. And the core logic is going to remain the same. So really try to get this presentation down. Um, but different types of experiments will rely upon different types of statistics, and thus will rely upon different types of probability distributions, which we'll talk about in great detail later on in the course. Now for Wednesday, continue the assigned reading um, begin working on homework two, and also make sure that you are working on the quiz, which is due Friday the 18th. <laughs>